go. Good afternoon, uh, welcome to Politics and Pearls Bookstore. My name is Rich, I'm a bookseller here, where we are now hosting in person and virtual events, along with partnering and supporting events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics.pearls.com. Before we start today, I'd just like you to ask to silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. And when we get time to open the floor, floor for questions, we press the standing microphone to the right at this pole here. If you can just line up and speak to the microphone, we want everyone to take a question and hear on the audio recording of the event. We have both audio and video recording and live stream today's program so that you or anyone you know can find on the Politics of Pearls YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we'll have a sign at this table here, so if you've not purchased the book already, we have plenty of copies behind the registers at the front of the store, and we'll ask you if you can line up next to this pillar here, and we'll come back and ask the name for personalizations, and um, so if you can have the book ready for us, that would be a great help. And once the event, actually no, because the event after this, so I was going to actually call the chairs up, but you can just leave the chairs out where they are. Um, so yeah, today, um, without further ado, I'm excited to welcome uh, Michael Benemy, an attendee of the University of Chicago. Benemy completed graduate work with Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher, and Harold Rosenberg, another noted intellectual, before moving to New York to play an important role in creating the modern day literature culture we know today. His work started with founding and editing the influential Christopher Street magazine, one of the first gay literary magazines that ran for 20 years from 1976. New York in the 70s would provide the ground upon which Benjamin would play an outsized role in promoting openly gay writers as a book and magazine editor. And his new book, On Christopher Street, chronicles this time and beyond. Michael Benjamin will be in conversation with Dr. Stephen Corsell. He is the founding director of the graduate program in health. GBT Health Policy and Practice at the George Washington University and teaches courses in LGBTQ topics including mental health, youth, and intersectionality. So please, yeah, put your hands together. Michael Benjamin and Dr. Stephen Fossil. So I, you can see I'm not used to this. So I had a short introduction to each section, sort of like a voiceover, and a documentary show to establish the style of the training to provide the narrative continuity. So what I'm going to do is trip from these narrative voiceovers to steps to start the gay community in the first 30 years after Stonewall. Their first section is called Morning Day in America, and that was in 1970. The Stonewall riots, which took place in Grand Cage in June of 1969, were a found in the underground gay world of America. That's what it felt like in my life. Loud, scattering noise that woke you up. William Sagerman wrote, quote, The 
there was a riot that eventually broke the spell on the country. The spell of gay fear. The fear of gay and lesbian people had been living with since World War II, when the persecution of homosexuals began with the strategy policy of the United States government. It was as if the whole generation had begun to wake up. To quote William Fagerman again, for village days, the Bible had been the equivalent of Rosa Parks taking a forbidden seat on the bus to Montgomery, Alabama. The rest of the world might not know it yet, but they knew that there was no going back to the way things had been. Stonewall's impact reverberated far and wide, ever deeper and ever broader, like the ripple of stone lakes when thrown into a pond, only enlarging rather than diminishing the time, eventually leading to the largest citizen movement for equal rights in America since the Civil Rights Movement. And immediately after the event, it drew contemporaries like myself and many, many others to New York City. Anxious to join the revolution, we thought Stonewall helped us find it. And initiating an enormously creative cultural turmoil in the 70s. But it's often forgotten that the first impact of Stonewall was one of liberation, sexual liberation. The gay movement had had its roots in the sexual liberation and feminist movements of the 60s. And the first result was an absolute explosion of gay sexual activity. Our historians will probably concentrate on the history of organizations and political heroes, how the Gay Liberation Front led to the Gay Activist Alliance, led to the Franklin Gay Task Force, how Frank Kennedy challenged the state, the story of Wars past elections contested, fought under one endorse. And this is history. But in the actual fabric of our daily life, what was more important and what really changed was sex. More sex. Much more sex. And not surprising to an obsession with sex led to an obsession with romance. The exhilaration and entanglements of sex and romance were what preoccupied and developed me the most regular times in the early 70s. It took a whole decade for this surge of sexual liberation to condense into a demand for gay civil rights. But given what followed in the 80s, an epidemic of death transmitted mainly by sexual activity, those of us who experienced the 70s attended not to speak about it much, perhaps embarrassed by our part in creating the conditions that made the epidemic possible. But the 70s were a truly remarkable decade. Calvin Klein said recently, quote, the 1970s were a pretty crazy time in New York. There was Berlin in the 20s, in Paris in the 30s, and New York in the 70s. And it was startling to see a whole generation, not just a small privileged elite, attempting to unleash and explore the erotic in their own lives. And as we went about rehabilitating lust and celebrating romance, the world opened up and she knew me again as on the first day. It was morning and day in America. Part two is entitled Beginning to Hunt Ourselves and covers the years 1980 to 1983. Precisely one century to the day before Stonewall, in June of 1869, Friedrich Engels wrote Karl Marx. The pederasts are beginning to count themselves and find that they make up a power in the state. Only the organization is lacking, but according to this, it already exists in secret. End quote. Wrote Engels. 
responding to a portrait by Carol Hatch, of which the first modern Russian photography defends homosexuality. Thus, Gregory Woods asserts in his book, Thomas Ben, a gay culture liberated the modern world. At the very time that homosexuality was beginning to be examined and theorized as an individual state of being, urging an aspect of identity, those who might be called homosexual were also beginning to be seen as a potential group with a common interest. It overt even a political movement capable of collective, collective action. Or if COVID, a subversive conspiracy. End quote. Woods goes on to show in detail in his remarkable book how during the next hundred years, so gay social networks spread extensively throughout Europe and America, while remaining for the most part covert. Leading indeed to persistent rumors of an infection of gay conspiracy, especially in the arts. Then, 100 years to the month after Engels wrote that letter, Paul Whitman in California was writing his gay manifesto, a book that is often called the Bible of his liberation. What was significant, said the report friend at the time, in a recent memoir, was that, quote, it was a call for action directed not at those in power or at society at large, but to gay people themselves, urging them to cast off the chains of length and slavery where sin could be clear. Everyone knows about the Stonewall riots of June 1st, 1969. But few people know that the Gay Manifesto was written before the riots, and it wasn't widely published until 1970. Evidently, the time was right. Whatever individual and social changes had been going on covertly for at least a hundred years would not go to public view with the gay explosion and the visibility. Gay politics had become inevitable, and we needed to think about it. The next section is called State of the Tribe and covers the year 1983 to 1987. The first report of what would turn out to be AIDS was published in the New York Native in the spring of 1981. But even before this report appeared, people in our community were getting sick. Strangely, diseases, and by the time the news made it into the paper, people were starting to die. There was virtually no discussion of these matters in the mainstream public media or in the medical press for months and then for years. But in the private world of friends and gossip, rumors started to spread like wildfire. The illnesses seem to have episodes. By arriving time, the number of houses were particularly hard hit. By the members of the Bible Games Club, the Saints, they were overlapping with. Or, some said, guys in the SM, or guys with the heavy drugs, heading for one particular drug. The rumors were endless and incessant. No one knew anything for sure, and the result was a period of confusion, panic, denial, and anxiety. An increasing dread as people all around us fell ill and died in our doctors seemed helpless. Something has happened, but what? For me, and I think for many of my peers, this period of confusion was swept away by the publication of one of the famous famous essay, 1112 and Counting. Two years of anguish and uncertainty and dread told us that to a hard determination to respond to this new and laudable method. It is now clear that we face an existential threat to our new way of life and our new way of making community. A threat that requires a heavy mobilization of the community to confront it. That's 
exciting this program that in the weeks that closed in the year 1988, uh, to 1990. Sometime in the 80s, uh, walking through the Metropolitan Museum at my regular exhibit, I was startled by the huge historical pyramids that were the back of the Medusa. Classical French early 19th century historical painting depicting the starving survivors of the shipwreck claimed to have risen to their rank as they're thrown about in turbulent storms. But they're not the type of art I usually look at as painting presented to my friends. And that's what it is. And so, my friends, this is the way we live now. This is a perfect depiction of our Muslim life. Shipwrecks, starving, dehydrated, dying, being tossed about by the spirit storm in question. It's not a painting I've gone back to see, but it's a painting I know is about. But if by the late 80s, I have to take some light on huge waves of hope, despair, anger, loss, betrayal, and anger. Constantly standing in this among the clouds of ignorance, prejudice, bitterness, and pessimism. As we realize the magnitude of the epidemic, we were horrified, angry, terrified, and pathologically depressed. We could see a wall of death coming. At the same time, the crisis brought up the best version of ourselves. Their group spawned spontaneously around me, their friends. We cooked meals, walked the dog, washed the dishes, arranged visits to the doctor. Whatever was needed to be done to keep a person's independent life going. As long as possible. Six, eight, ten people, ex lovers, ex boyfriends, gym buddies, work colleagues. Perfect strangers who are called volunteers. We somehow get in touch with each other to figure out what needed to be done and keep everyone up to date with John Robin Foster every night. And by the end, when there was nothing more we could do, we could be there. We could be comfortable so that we could talk. So they wouldn't be alone. The AIDS crisis triggered an outburst of caring and community. A daily heroism that demonstrated to me that we were a living gay community taking care of its own in the worst of times. The AIDS epidemic paradox of the American gay community of living reality and a source of strength. Next. Section covered from the year 1991 to 96, and is called The Regarding the Darkness of Age of Realists. By the time the 90s had begun, the future looked bleak. Medical knowledge of the disease had grown, but only to convince us all of the difficulty of ever finding a cure or a vaccine. When we had really understood how long the incubation period could be, when a person had no symptoms but could still be infectious and spread the disease, many of us came to the same conclusion Steve Jones had in the doctor of Mark Marcus Tony, first explained to him how AIDS would spread. Well, he said, after a pause, and the best came more rapidly now with June's tremendous memorial services becoming constant, common, and recurring events in our lives. In my journal, I found this note from March of 1975, and I'm quoting. At the memorial service, the stand up and roll today, police took on our children this story. For his 40th birthday, which was May 10th of previously, Vito Russo and Clovis Rock, 
Person alive. From that time, the other 72 day month. At this memorial service, I'm standing up by a little story, say that we were having to fall on the next Monday. Seemed that the packing was sufficient. Two memorial services this week were held in the together. The church of Syracuse came in and for the first time in the effort of my life, there was not the hope that Joe began to work. People in the village of Christ started improving as a matter of their effects, even walking. Disoriented in the summer of the day, and so did some that were given their thanks. For the first time in the effort of my life, Storm was over, and now we have to wait. Yet the enemy, those of us who were still alive, it turned out to feel like a very small remnant. Very few of us will tend to survive, maybe to be more brief, but I do not feel good. But evidently we have survived. We have community where I think that we have survived. We've taken well to the church. As Steve Jones has said, before AIDS, the notion of an LGBT community was just a notion. But AIDS proved this. AIDS created a militancy and political power. The first expressed itself in the powerful street theater of Baghdad and continued to regeneration with free action, housing works. And how that AIDS also changed the way we view marriage. Now I'm listed as a fighter, even life saving right. We looked around us at the lives we were living, we saw loving partners spend night and day with dying brothers, dressing the wounds, painting the bed curtains, changing the IV line. So they have looked at you and said, What do you do? This is a good method. Fuck you. This is exactly what a good method looks like. Thus, as the nineties came to a close, we were ready for the next fight. The trucks were fully quieted from the beginnings to the end. The great critical awakening that had started from Cold to Cold, sidetracked us all. We turned in full force. And the surprising triumph of the gay marriage of the ladies in the military seemed to herald a new chapter in gay history, bringing to a close, really bringing to a close, the third year of the gay liberation. Sorry about the losing the church. Thank you, Michael, and thanks everyone for coming out. Um, and that, that was from a uh, 2019 uh, talk you gave in Connecticut College, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. 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 Good.
a very good offer and, and low price offer, but for the most part, you're kind of in the uh, you're sort of the you know the genius behind the, uh, behind the artist, and and I've got a, just a brief list of some of the offers we've, we've edited. It's not all that brief. Um, Randy Silks, uh, Ethan Morgan, Chris Davis, John Fox, Alan Burnett, uh, Paul Paul Manette, uh, Mr. Donnelly, Rob Dalmadine, David Brooks, Edmund White, Don Price, Neil Marie Robin. That's you know, pretty impressive list, but. You know, as an editor, you're, you're kind of, like I said, in the background, you like to, you know, sit the blind next to you to the Beatles kind of person. <laughs> um, so people don't, you know, they, they probably don't you know you personally as well as, as perhaps some of the writers. But so that's why I did want to spend some time talking about you and where you came from. Now, you were uh, what, born, well, first of all, you have a birthday recently, if you don't mind me saying that you're now eight years old as of March uh, 2nd, so congratulations. Yes. <laughs> you enjoy it. You enjoy it. That's what you do. Yeah. Um, but uh, so you were, uh, I, I guess you just came from a sort of working class Irish family in Rhode Island, correct? Yeah. Okay, where did you grow up? I came in the early 2000s and married in a small town. Grew up in the part of Rhode Island. Now, what was it? You talk often, and in, in our personal conversation, and somewhat in the book as well, about how you know, you're kind of the last generation that had to wonder if there's someone else like you out there in the world. Um, so, you obviously grew up in the '50s in a very conservative environment. What I mean, what was that like as a person trying to discover your gayness and and uh, you know? I think it's a challenge for people today to realize what it was like in the 40s and 50s. I mean, I think as a response to the end of World War II, you know, there was this incredible cultural effort to put women back into the kitchen and to help that people settle. And in the 50s, actually, I think was the most intensely homophobic decade in American history. It's surprising to me. I thought, as my younger that things would be slowly getting better and better. I don't. And in gay life, it's much better in the 1920s. In gay life, it's even better in the 1890s. I mean, really, the most intensely homophobic decade was the 1950s, which, of course, was the reaction that we saw in the 60s. Um, now, you ended up at University of Chicago kind of certain accident of sorts. Can you tell the story about how you ended up in Chicago? Yeah, totally by accident. Um, my mother worked in a sweat shop in costume jewelry, and I worked with the last two summers of my high school. And um, her boss, this is not a fact. It turned out that the University of Chicago, the University of Chicago, plus 20 bucks, was to apply to the University of Chicago, plus 5 bucks. And 20 dollars was what my mother made per week working 20 hours a week. And a dollar an hour was not as it was back then, but in the 50s. Uh, so Ralph, who was actually an assistant budget, said, I'll pay the so he came to it, and I applied, and I got in, and I managed to get in and get this wonderful scholarship, because otherwise I couldn't have gone. And so I went, and it was the, for me, it was the perfect place. I stayed there for the next seven years, and I got my BA, got my MA, started teaching at Harvard. And then finally got to the 
But you had a, a really close relationship with your mentor in um, graduate school. Um, I just said this now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know how much what I mean is I think there was a course we took in the spring semester of my fourth year, 1964. And at the time, I had just been constructing a principal in the United States to get the idea of the trainings in Columbia University, et cetera. And I started, I just started this course in the spring. So they were in consideration of the basic moral proposition of Socrates to Nietzsche. And I decided, okay, what do you do up here? You know? And I decided to apply to the Committee on Social Work to continue studying with this woman who was quite remarkable. And essentially, the best education I accepted this, you know. And I, I thought I would be an academic because basically I took the school since I was four years old. And I had been looked at and I was an accurate student, but I didn't have any other experience. But I slowly realized that I'd made a real categorical error. I was confused by the liberal education, which I found incredibly exciting, with being a spy. And then not at all. Getting liberal education, you're always just investigating new features, you're always growing, et cetera, et cetera. As a scholar, you go over the same field again and again and again until you know more than anybody else knows about this field. And as I got into that, I discovered I didn't really like it, you know. So I decided to leave. Um, and also at the same time, I was 69, I had done this wake up call in terms of being gay. I tried being gay in Chicago, and it didn't work. Um, you know, I had worked myself up to having these difficult testimonies to my best friends, and they just wouldn't take it seriously. You know, they'd say, oh, you know, you just to be involved with SDS. Just took it as a matter of just political enthusiasm. So I decided I had to go to the New City. And at the same time, my son, her husband had died, and her husband had his first child by my son. And she decided she could have my husband not be here in Chicago. So I moved to New York. So I could have been in New York in no time since the three. As long as, I kept, as long as I sat in the back and kept my knees back, I survived, you know? Um, and then I had to find a day job. Um, basically, at the time, I thought, well, I would like to work in the theater. The only problem was I had absolutely no time of any sort, you know? And while there are many times available in the theater in New York City, none of them pay. Yes, you can get the scene. Yes, you can do this, you can do that. But they pay. And I think you should pay the rent. And the only thing on my first year in Utah that was not an academic was the two years I spent working on a copy of the Times of Chicago Press. And so I tried that and I got a job at the Illinois Times. This is 1971. I don't know if any of you have seen Mad Men, but that's exactly the way these corporations work in 1971. Where everybody had two or three martinis for lunch, and the two martinis put them under the table. And how the hell did they get back to the office? You know? And everybody wore shirts and ties and suits, and I did not own a suit. So I decided I had to start a small group somehow. And in one of the locals, the main small group was Sam Sanford. And I said, okay, I'll play that role. I'll get to be the big Sanford for this organization. And slowly I saw that there was some interesting things happening. And the first books I really came by were the political. I, I 
as they said in 1850 and 1860s. And while I didn't understand the prophecy at all, I knew the politics. And the, the, the book that was slammed down my desk, I was told it was cancer. Uh, and it's a book by Dean Sakai called Passion. I realized it was full of politics. And she was told it was a contested issue at that time. Fortunately, the guy did not know how to write. And then I said, he did. And the truth is, the result was really powerful. I mean, in days of just about storm, I had Chicago and St. Louis and New York City all over the country to take this. Uh, so I worked with Oscar. Oscar Mann was the editor. And it's a picture that I am on the front cover of the book. Some very Very stupidly. And um, I didn't know. And I was sent to two dance girls in town, two dance girls in Northern New York, and given a copy of the manuscript for the sake of my own getting into competition. And as long as you got high with my assistant, I was good enough. They could take notes for the things that I was saying to them. After two days, essentially suggested that if I reverse the policy and use high rises for public housing, 180 degrees, then the book couldn't possibly be in a contract anymore. They agreed with me. Thank you very much. And so they held HUD, held the press conference in the summer or August or December or something in federal policy of the use of high rises was totally reversed and started bombing the country. And uh, in St. Louis, I think the bombing was a wonderful thing that they did. And in other cities, they started cementing them up after the AIDS war. And I said, that's the way to go. You didn't get out of the story that was in the end. So I thought, okay, okay, I might be able to do something interesting here. Publishing is a wonderful tool for that reason because the, because you're constantly it's the reverse of scholarship. You're constantly doing something different, you know. I mean, I published my Shakespeare Poe and I published Mr. T. You know, I mean, you can 
what other type of job? You give me that type of diversity. You know? It's really interesting. And that's the all of the things. Um, so, how, how, so, well, how did Christmas Magazine come together and how exciting was it in that time for Stonewall to be working on a project that really became sort of like, you know, the, the flag bearer of, of, of all, you know, different publications. It really, it really set up so much. What was it like doing that at that time in the 1970s? Uh, it was exciting. And I got to New York and I got involved in the USA. Thank you. 
about is merging and uh, a certain thing is like it sometimes it just becomes a more sound. Um, so I, I, I have a particular position here in my mind. Supposedly the only gay LGBT city is the city of Yeah, right, right. Well, real, real quickly, one more time. I just want to want to do one more thing with you real, real quickly, and then we, we want to make sure people have a uh, chance to ask questions. In the preface, uh, you said you said an early draft of the manuscript to a friend who said it's too much inside baseball. <laughs> like the stories are a little too close to personal. Like you came back with a pretty personal response to that, which I admire. Which something along you can refine this, but. Something along the lines of like we need to tell these stories, these personal experiences that you had. And in fact, I think you described your work. Ed White described the new gay fiction as auto fiction. You talked about your you know, this book in particular is auto nonfiction. But these these stories are very important. And we've had private conversations, and you know, people our age, and always have conversations with way younger people understanding the importance of this. And you're relating the friends that you lost to a certain age. Um, you know, I, I'm much, much younger, but I turned 18 in 1980, and I saw this starting to happen, and I fortunately, you know, was missed all that, but a lot of younger people don't know it, um, and I think maybe that was sort of like the thrust of your other response to that too much inside baseball question. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make, you can comment on that if you want to. I do want to point out that there's uh, a less than 40-year-old gentleman in the who does it for years research and, and understands how important that is, so... We'll have a conversation afterward. Um, yeah, and any comment on sort of like, uh, you know, youth and what's important then moving forward and understanding what happened in 1969 moving forward. Yeah, the, the one thing I wanted to be clear is that I'm writing about a period of this book in the result of having a kind of question and putting this book together. Really kind of to the realization that this period, this era of history, is one where a lot of young LGBT citizens are very, very critical. Um, we read everything and responded to everything, and to my amazement, he, he yearned for this type of social consciousness, and he said it didn't exist for her generation. To the end of the book, you know, back then we thought of the 20 to 30 years of this book. And that made me realize, and, and other things made me realize, he's 50 years old and all that. And he, he writes of the day of all the age of 60. Um, but they're all children. They're all children in very expensive ways. Also, I got very excited about writing a book that was about the young people. And he and I were taking this out to home together. So we were just talking about this, and I asked him what he would like to do. And he said, Well, no, because it's like when you see trains going. And they had plenty of people to the back. But the beginning of COVID. So many delays that one of them said to the other, you know, look at all these people see that balcony. And you know, this I did not know. Evidently in the seventy five percent of the trains in New York, that seventy five percent of trains in New York are disabled people who do not have legs in their legs. In fact, they have no legs. And so they did. And this is where we get into and I wanted to ask him, what did the hospital do? You know, what did the city provide itself? What did the people? And we don't know quite what you can ask about being the base of anybody. Um, but I hope to spend more time with Dr. Duncan because I really enjoy this book. 
But the fact is that it is so clear this is not what bothers the world. The other thing is, that's what I'm writing about. It bothers the world. You know, the political agenda that we have that's in the system. And I'm, I was not sure of whether or not the people would be convicted or not. All right, we're, we're, we're running short on time, but uh, there's a microphone there which uh, we ask, uh, they ask us to ask you to do the behind it. So this is being streamed and all that. So they don't hear you unless you, you it's, a microphone, it's right behind that, that column there. So if you don't see it, you can walk up to that microphone and, and ask your question. <clears throat> and while someone's being brave enough to get up and do that, <laughs> um, oh, there we go. I knew you'd be the one. So, Michael, I guess you can come over here. But my question is, is there any truth? You talked about how hard it was for you to get a job in the news and get a job in the company. Is there any truth to the rumor that you actually got fired from one job and being out of opportunities and all sorts of you and having to pay rent that you just decided to ignore that firing and go back to work and, and keep going back <laughs> to where that eventually just kept you? My first job, as I mentioned, was with the Yankee company in Jersey, doing artwork on the street of the Cosmos. And I was about kind of hard to achieve. And actually, I worked there for five years. And I was fired five times. You know, I was fired by the time you're talking about it. I can't remember what I did. It's the other thing too for five years. And I pretended to bother him. I just ignored him. And he was such an idiot. He didn't know how to respond to that. You know, he would see me the next day in the car or the truck and say, But um, I, I signed up for one of the very first gay books called The Homosexual. Every single other editor in the chief except for Jim Mayhew, including the editor in chief, refused to send it to the county. So they recopied it. This was on my book, you know? And then I published and got the Sunday, the publisher of the Sixteenth Century Suicide, the Rain Books, and all that. I never understood why, you know, at the time, this is 1975, the Polish Brothers was this huge success on Broadway. It was all over. This was, this was the first major black Spanish film to hit the culture. And then the book had an auction, 18 publishers entered the auction to try to publish this book, and I won it without the highest bid of the third in the highest bid. That was the best idea that I had done for the book. Um, so they were hired me for that, and then they went to the college president of the public factory. So they hired me again. But then when Christopher King came out, I was fired. And by now I had um, good friends in the district, but, you know, 
sent several others to the Lord. He's especially nineteen seventy the seventh time of the seventy six of them. It was totally in New York State to buy a Sunday to the Lord. And the Lord has said Hegel tries to say that he was fired for cause, in other words, to put the bounty on him. You've got a very good chance of him. Because I have published books that made a lot of money, I have published books that have the big syntax, etc., etc. But he says he fired you because it was not appropriate for the company to have a homosexual. Of the company, there's nothing 